of owning a cafe and other heroic deeds by the Chapter 86 Enter Todoroki Rei Considering they'd headed out at 1210, he was actually beyond surprised that it was only 1600 when he checked his phone. Oh, the cool. Today had felt like an age all by itself. Oh, hey. Did my right call you? It was a damn good job that they weren't having his and his teens walk up to the family party until Friday, wasn't it? God, trying to ramp themselves up for such a thing right now would have been difficult, wouldn't it? Yes, I, I hope I'm not intruding. Not that he wasn't great for the swift responses, considerate talks, and rapid action on the behalf of the pros and their police force allies, especially since everyone was so clearly concerned over the allegations that the former Todoroki had made against his father and his staff. In fact, he couldn't be more pleased by the united front and belief they had in the teen, especially given Endeavor's status and ranking. This whole situation, of course, must have given credence to a great many people's dislike of the man. The man who was going to have a very rude awakening once he came back and to ensure that he did return, all of their work and efforts had to be out of the spotlight. They had to be stealthy, and since money talked like nothing else these days, having the bank balances of Marai and the man who just entered the room was going to be vital. So vital that he couldn't bring himself to feel bad about asking for such huge favors, even as he opened the door a little wider and beckoned All Might in full regalia inside the small conference room they'd been given in the back of the station with another round of soda. Kenji-san had been wonderfully considerate of their privacy and Dabi's mental state, which meant that they'd been rarely bothered and no officers not directly involved in their case had poked their noses around. He similarly welcomed the hug the taller man offered him. He... he really needed it. Ugh, shouldn't that be my line? I feel as though I'm always encroaching on your time lately. And all you have to show for it is fewer yen in your pocket and muffin crumbs. He grinned that their bodies stood in the doorway while Zdabi and Thurma, both exhausted, slumped together at the table, each watching as the older teen sent out text to their nearest and dearest. The older of the newly dubbed Aizawas wanted to speak with all of them at once, and had asked him to pass on the news to his care center siblings. He had, of course, and within seconds the flame quirk user had juggled and forwarded on a few choice messages he had received from the older teens to his phone. Usually he would have lightly chastised Naoki and Takeo for sending gifts which alluded to violence. However, on this occasion, he let it slide. What? There were quite a few gifts, which showed the Todoroki being blasted with fire hoses until he literally exploded. Others displayed the man saying, I must return to my home planet, my people need me, before he vaulted into the sun and promptly met his aunt. Sensational. Sure, Takun, I realize that you're trying to make light of an awful situation, but please... You must never believe that any time I could spend with you and your family would be an intrusion on me. The blonde stated those strong arms still holding him. I only wish that there was more I could do. He sighed his head, nodding to the boys. And I have thought, even for a second, that Todoroki's bravado was a cover for such madness that... Ah, none of that. He interrupted, his tone fond but serious. We've unanimously decided that we're not going to play the blame game. He told him, his right hand patting that impressive chest. It's illogical to place any kind of anger or penalties upon ourselves when that rat bastard is the one at fault. He added with the other's eyes narrowing. He's caused enough pain and anguish without us adding to it. So we're not going to dwell on what we can't do, but on what we can as rationality is often the best way to deal with such things, right? He reminded, his face turning back to his oldest wards, both of them regarding him fondly. He's got away with words, aren't you, son? Tomra smiled, that expression brightening a touch when he gestured for Toshinori to make his way over to them, that beyond powerful body bringing both of the teams into his arms for a soft embrace. Despite the number one pro not spouting off his most famous catchphrase, he had a sneaking suspicion that everything was going to be okay now. Now we're going to have my first support, all right? Not just because he was here. Uh, thanks, Toshinori Jisun. 
but because they all were. Getting home always felt good. However, as the tots rushed them, some of the regulars beckoned them inside, and the local pros tackled them! He couldn't help his smile! Terrible and tragic circumstances notwithstanding, to watch his teens be whisked into a veritable whirlwind of love and support without anyone having been told anything made his heart feel full. Shoni, do you need a hug? Just as having love lavished on himself, of course. I actually really do. He smiled, his body kneeling down so that Hitoshi, Eijiro, and Izuku could slap him. His body nearly falling to the warm concrete floor next to his red and yellow parasols when Otaka and Tsuyu similarly flung themselves onto him, all of them asking if he was okay and if there was anything they could do to help. You girls to be thirsty, so I'll get you lemonade! What? You must be really hot, too! I'll go ask Tom on me for an ice bag! Me fuck, yellow! Here, let me take your jacket! I saved you some of my lunchtime cookies because we ran out. I'll get them for you now, all right? Tackling, he allowed them to pull him inside whilst Nemuri and Hizashi gushed over him and Oboro tethered pleasantly with Naomasa, who would come with them with strict orders to keep them updated. For when they left the station, there'd have been a flurry of activity buzzing about the matter, and although he had wanted to be more involved, his teens needed to get back home, and his friends definitely needed him back behind the service bar. Plus, he wasn't surprised to see Nezu scampering up to them on the way out, the white-furred man consoling them and promising results at the earliest opportunity before he ushered a quiet, reserved-looking Hawks towards the police force's central command room. Hawks, who didn't have the same gleam in his amber eyes as when they'd first met. Hawks, who wasn't with Matsuri-san. Hawks, who was reserved, quiet, and watchful. So watchful and closed off, in fact, that when he'd went to say hello, the teen had remained tight-lipped, bowed, and quickly walked on. There'd been something about how he'd quietly watched Dabi, too. He'd struggled to place it, but he reminded himself that they had bigger problems to suffer through. Not that he didn't want to help the crimson-winged boy and his slowly recovering comrade, however, in the first instance, his wards had to come first. Speaking of which, ah, uh, it does not like you. He smiled, his hands gratefully accepting the puppet cookies the iris hair job presented him as they entered the relatively quiet Stray Cat Cafe, his eyes casting about the few seated patrons whilst Mimi-jan and the girls fawned over his teens, telling them how handsome they were. He then gazed fondly at Kohaku, accepting another glass of lemonade from Izuku, whilst Eijiro and the girls gestured that he sit in Davi's booth, the little hands offering a drink and ice packs whilst... Tomoko physically deflated and waved at him, her hair kept slightly askew to show how hard she'd been working. Nomori and Hizashi similarly had crashed into the booth behind him, both of them spouting off their woes to a considerately sheepishly smiling Naomasa and Oboro, their laughter met with mock outrage. Sigurame Kenji regarded the men and women assigned before him with the staunch grim-faced facade he was known for, a hollow screen projection, slathered with everything they'd need to know in the first instance, hovering reassuredly at his side. Thank you for your time this afternoon, he began the room quieting. As one of the police force's most senior officers, it is with no pleasure that I must open an investigation into one of our own, one of the top five pros, no less. He huffed. However, in light of the allegations made by one previously considered deceased Todoroki Toya, now Aizawa Dabi, I cannot stress how serious this case is or the need for delicacy and privacy considering the next steps we must face together. He stated gruffly, a few mutters rumbling around the room. However, to get you all up to speed, we'll start from the beginning before highlighting the actions we'll take and the sequence they'll be taken in. Tamakawa, if you would. Taking a step back, the cat kirked officer bowing, rising from his feet and taking his place behind the lectern. Kenji moved to the side and leaned against the wall, his gaze momentarily lifting from the tablet he held to appraise the room. At approximately 1321 today, August 5th, Sir Naidai contacted HQ concerning a range of serious allegations made against number two ranked pro hero Endeavor, also known as Todoroki Enji, by a 16-year-old claiming to be Todoroki Toya. He'd contacted his boss straight away, of course, and given the severity of the accusations, the man whose job he was gunning for 
had given him three of their most astute detectives, two fantastic family liaison officers, and had welcomed him to select whomever else he felt would be needed. Todoroki-kun is now of protected person status and has emancipated himself from his biological family. However, he has been completely cooperative and based on his DNA profile being a 99.9 .9 match with endeavors, we have every reason to believe that his testimony is accurate and truthfully given. Yagi Toshinori and Sasaki Mirai, of course, were deeply involved, regardless of their connection to the Aizawa family, since All Might was the current number one, and Sir Nairai was the head of two hero programs, which not only appraised former criminals for rehabilitation, eh, but reviewed hero behavior alongside the Hero Public Safety Commission, they had to be consulted and included in the investigations. So far, we have his official statement. Several names of staff who have worked with the Todoroki family and information as to the family's current whereabouts. Nezu, however, was someone he hadn't expected to see. His duties and impending promotion at UA aside, he was unsure why the genius would be here, let alone with one of the five young people he'd recently become responsible for. In accordance with the HPSC guidelines, when Todoroki Enji made the decision to sojourn from his hero duties for training purposes, he has left satellite coordinates for the monastery he's taken as his current primary residence just outside of Tibet and conduct numbers where he can be reached in the case of an emergency. However, we're keeping those channels closed and instead have made contact with Upahaji Jing, his senior monk who is teaching and overseeing the Todoroki children there. When he asked, the white-furred man had led him to a quiet corridor to explain he was pioneering a dormitory system at his school and, to test out how that would work, He'd taken guardianship of the five students involved in Project Reformation and was rehousing them on site. This was something he hoped could be developed over time. Thus far, the Upa Haiji has been able to confirm our suspicions of neglect. He and his brothers have had to step in on more than one occasion when they felt Todoroki's expectations of the youngest boy Shoto have been too steep. He has promised daily updates and is willing to cooperate with us in any and all capacities we require with the permission of the monastery's highest-ranking elder. He'd surmised through his high-spec gifted powers of deduction that if the Todoroki children had nowhere else to go once their father was incarcerated, because he would be, he could use loco parentis laws to board them at UA. It would be, the former animal proposed, just like the children attending a boarding school until such time that their mother could regain custody. He knew in his heart that Aizawa Shoda would no doubt want to take them all in, and yet he, Toshinori, Mirai, and himself agreeing, they wanted to broach this idea to him and Dabi as the best way forward. We were also tracking down people listed by Aizawa-kun as nannies, who we believe were paid vast sums to be complicit in the neglect and abuse of the children at his wife, Todoroki Rei. The children, certainly all traumatized in some way or another, would need counseling, round-the-clock support, and goodness only knew what else. They couldn't bear the thought of their cat dad working himself into the ground to meet those kinds of needs, for even though their favorite eatery owner was someone who loved rationality, his heart would override any common sense if helping another person, especially a child, was at stake. After a little digging, we found that Tororogi Rei ni Himura has been a resident of Osakawa Psychological Hospital's mental health unit for just over a year. Being a private facility, access to her records is proving difficult. However, now that we have proof positive that Aizawa-kun is her son, we're working with the hospital to ensure he can visit her quietly. We have, of course, made them aware that Todoroki Enji is under a pending investigation, and unsurprisingly, although the psychiatrist overseeing her recovery can't go into details due to doctor-patient confidentiality, we have been told that she has, on several occasions, accused her husband of abusive behaviors and actions. This, though, hadn't explained to him why the pro-hero Hawks had joined his new boss here today. When he'd said as much to the soon-to-be principal, the other's eyes had gleamed. I'm practicing a full disclosure policy with my new employees, sugarame san and when Endeavor's name came up in the conversation we had, it was over loudspeakers on my phone, and Tamaki-kun asked to tug along. He said, I fear that that young man sees Todoroki as an idol, and I'd much rather have that kind of fixation dispelled sooner rather than later. It also wouldn't hurt to have someone with a different perspective here for violence, would it you say? From a legal standpoint, having a devil's advocate could potentially be in their favor, he supposed, but it didn't mean he had to be happy about it. 
Behaviors and actions which, due to her mental state and Todoroki's power, wealth, and influence, had previously been cited as delusions. Needless to say, in light of this afternoon's events, the chief medical practitioner will be reviewing their faculty's standards and practices. Yep. Then the room at large debriefed. He resumed control of the meeting and began dishing out assignments. They had two years to build a case, and although he'd much prefer to bring the bastard to justice right now and ensure that the children were safe, to move now would be too risky. If that bastard knew what he was doing, he could simply choose not to come home, couldn't he? Also, he couldn't argue that having this time would be hugely beneficial for, regardless of his hero-based income, Enji came from a wealthy and privileged family whose legal deem was more legendary than the man's fiery temper. Not that that would matter by the time they were through. He'd make sure of it. Sitting quietly in her austere room, her dull eyes staring listlessly through the window at the lovely garden she could walk around if she wanted, Ray found her fingers absent-mindedly playing with the pen she held, today's letter for her daughter still lying there upon the desk, unfinished for the time being. She wrote a letter to each child, including Toya and Shoto, every day. In fact, aside from eating, sleeping, taking her anxiety medicine, and talking with the doctors, that was all she did. All she could do, as she was left to rot here, as she was left to atone for her sins, to regret being born a Himura, to mourn her lack of choice, to quietly seethe, to cry. Not that these things would help, of course, nothing would. For what could she do? Angie had convinced them she was mad. Angie had paid handsomely for her care. Angie had stolen everything that she'd valued about herself. The right to be a mother, the right to raise her children, the right to beg for forgiveness, the right to a divorce. Sighing, she stifled a sniffle and resumed writing to Fuyumi before, like always, she'd begin penning to Natsuo, then Toya, and her youngest. This... This was her life now, and... Knock, knock blinking. It was 1800. This was her private time, wasn't it? She turned to her small room's door and called. Yes? Ray san I'm sorry to disturb you, one of the flindlier nurses stated as he carefully entered, his seal features offering a polite smile. But you have a visitor, he stated before pulling the barrier to one side for her to view a dog-headed man, his expression soft and but polite. Good evening, todoroki son, he said. My name is Sugarame Kenji, and I'm a lieutenant of the police force. He furthered, may I come in and speak with you? I believe that you're right to place a formal complaint against your husband, and the abuses you have suffered is long overdue. 